very good morning to all our viewers and thank you for tuning in to our series of webinars on animals by the Animal and Veterinary Service, a cluster of the National Parks Board. My name is Dr. Lin Anhui and I'm very happy to introduce our special guest with us here today, Dr. Chow Hao Ting. Hi, good morning everyone. As a vet in the Animal and Veterinary Service, I'm involved in the Trap, Neuter, Release, Manage program for stray dogs. This is a humane, science-based approach to managing the stray dog population in Singapore. I also work with my team at the Centre for Animal Rehabilitation, where we aim to reunite lost pets with their owners and rehabilitate stray animals so that we can find loving homes for as many of them as possible. So if you're thinking of getting a pet, uh, do consider adopting one. We work with our animal welfare group partners on both of these programmes, so do consider adopting one from them. Now, Dr. Chow is a veterinarian at the Joyous Vet and has been actively involved in the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in Singapore since 2018. He is also a member of the Singapore Veterinary Association Executive Committee. Dr. Chow is a fear-free certified veterinary professional. The program strives to eliminate, eliminate fear, anxiety and stress in animals, creating a veterinary experience that is better and safer for all involved. Dr. Chow has also completed Dr. Ian Dunbar's Cyrus Dog Trainer Program. We are glad to have Dr. Chow share on how we can identify and manage your pet's anxiety. Anxiety in pets could be easily noticed, such as your pet dog cowering in a corner or a rabbit hiding in its hutch. It can also be more subtle signs, such as um, the dog pacing around or being hypervigilant or not eating even though it's hungry. So let's have a look at all the different um, ways we can identify and manage anxiety in your pets. Let's get to the talk. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments box below and we'll address them later. Dr. Okay. Chow, please. Okay, um, so let's go right into it. Before we begin, on the screen right now, there are uh, two books that I highly recommend. One is Decoding Your Dog and one is Decoding Your Cat. Um, both books are written by the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. So these are actually vets who have gone through extra training, intensive training in veterinary behavior medicine. So they are actually like so-called the psychiatrists of the animal world. So actually if you uh, own a dog or you own a cat, I highly recommend you get the, these books because they are actually written in a way where it's easy to understand and also it is actually quite uh, interesting to read. It's not that boring because now, nowadays I think um, a lot of people don't have time or they find reading quite boring. But the main thing is, as long as you buy and read these books, you can um, skip this webinar I'm going to give, actually. So, um, so today, we're going to run through some fundamentals of behavior, and then we'll go into anxiety, how to manage it, followed by uh, anxiety disorder example. So in the next uh, slide, we'll be playing a video showing you interaction between a puppy owner and a puppy. And then we're going through this video just Notice if you can see any subtle cues the puppy is actually showing to the pet owner about whether the puppy is uh, comfortable, uncomfortable, happy, or upset. So let's take a look at this video. Zany says no. She actually says no many times in dog body language. In 27 seconds, she did four lip licks, seven head turns away, two full body turns away, and two shrinking back. All of these are typical signs of stress or avoidance. Here's a lip lick. Head turn. Full body turn away. Shrinking back from hand. This is pretty clear communication once we get a good look at it. Zany could have left, but she stayed, probably because she anticipated that what we were doing might turn into a training session. 
so why is this video important? So a lot of times you may have heard of uh, horror stories where a particular dog or cat actually bite without warning or showing any aggression, suddenly the dog just reacted. But a lot of times actually if you take a deep dive into these situations, the dog is, or, or the pet in question is actually desperately trying to show all this um, body language, these behavior cues about their emotional uh, being. And then a lot of times, unfortunately, it is the fault of us during this interaction when we are unable to observe all these subtle cues. So the next slide we talk about, why should we care about the emotional health of your pet? So the main thing is emotions impact health, welfare, and also most importantly, the relationship we have with our pets. And many aspects of behavior can be managed and we actually understand the emotions behind. So a lot of times, before we actually see the behavior, which is the observable part, the event happens first, and then next, the consequence actually determines whether the behavior will happen again in the future. So un at the, underneath, the, underneath the surface, actually, there are physiological changes, which is like increasing the heart rate, increasing of blood glucose, increasing of um, stress-related hormones, and then there's the psychological component, which are the emotions, happy, sad, angry, etc., which also happens in animals as well. So what actually influences behavior? So this part, this short, brief segment is a bit dry, but it's important to understand all these things before you can actually think about how do you improve or um, train your pet. So the bi biological importance of a stimulus to the animal, let's say there's a fire, of course, is for the benefit of the pet to run away and turn away from that negative stimulus instead of running towards the fire. Genetics play a part as well. And then um, the developmental stages also, for example, usually for puppies, they are more open to new changes, they are more open to strangers, but as they grow older, they become more wary and careful. The environment, of course, definitely plays a part with the environment where they grew up in to impact how they respond in the future. So it's another slide to, to show what I mentioned earlier. So, so stimulus, it can be what they see, they hear, the taste also smells also a very important one because for humans our sense of smell may not be as strong but for animals usually when they go into an empty room for example in a vet clinic they can actually smell before they were there there were uh, another dog another cat for example and then in the brain all the electrodes start firing they start thinking about what to do next and then what you actually see is the response whether it's stress or happiness or these things like that so for response it's the emotional response Usually we cannot see it, it's how they feel, and then the behavior how we see, the body languages, the movement, and then the physiological changes. Sometimes um, the behavior aspect would change over time depending on uh, the consequences I mentioned earlier. So let's say whenever a dog starts to growl, unfortunately, if you keep scolding or if you, you punish your dog for growling, sometimes they may, uh, sorry, I moved the cursor a bit too much. Anyway, um, so let's say, Talking about the growling is very important because in the uh, dog training world, there's this concept called the gift of the growl. So whenever a dog growls, actually what they're trying to say is this is an uncomfortable situation. This is actually a warning signal. But actually if you keep punishing or scolding a dog for growling, after a while they realize when they growl, they get punished, so they stop growling. Then what happens is that whenever a dog is in an uh, uncomfortable situation, they skip growling and they go straight, they escalate their behavior, they go straight to using their teeth to defend themselves. So a lot of times, try, a lot of times try not to punish your pet for exhibiting emotions. So for a behavior response, it's a flight and fight that we are very um, familiar with. And there's also freezing. Freezing will come to that later where the pet actually stops moving when they meet a negative stimulus. And also fiddling. Fiddling is like when you are anxious. For example, just now I keep moving the mouse because I'm a bit nervous. It's on fiddling as well. So fiddling involves usually conflict. In the animal I'm not sure how to respond and also appeasement behavior. So um, a very common appeasement behavior is actually humping. So I have uh, common questions by um, pet owners is that it's a female dog that actually sterilized already, but actually when their family or friends comes to the house, the female dog actually harms the visitor. So they're wondering if the female dog is actually exerting like sexual dominance, for example, but actually the female dog actually sterilized. So actually Humping is also a form of appeasement behavior. So basically, in that new interaction with the visitor, the dog doesn't know what to do. 
So the dog just resorts to any behavior they can think of, which unfortunately in that scenario is actually hunting. So actually it's not because that uh, the dog trying to exert dominance, mainly it's actually uh, the dog trying to show that they actually need help to cope in that scenario. So the main thing about um, the webinar today is recognizing FAS, which is fear, anxiety, and stress in your pet. So we talk about, uh, we all know where a dog is pretty uncomfortable, they will cow. So cowering and slight cowering, just a slight adjustment in the posture. And then another thing is actually the licking of the lips as mentioned in the video earlier, panting. And then the ears moving to the side and they are bowed. And you can see them frowning slightly. And then um, yawning also. A lot of times, uh, uncomfortable scenarios, a, dog, a lot of dogs start to yawn or they act, pretend they are sleepy, hyper vigilant where they are like running around, pacing. And then uh, another thing is also if your dog is usually food motivated, your pet as well, your cat or rabbit, if your rabbits actually, they really like blueberries. So, but then in the uncomfortable scenario, if you give them a treat, they're not willing to eat. So, so it's also a sign of uh, fear or anxiety. So now I'll talk about freezing. So uh, certain dog training communities, they advocate the alpha role to uh, exert dominance in that um, pet, pet owner relationship. So a lot of times the alpha role, what happens if you look at this part here when my pointer is, if I move it very slowly, um, the, the dog momentarily freezes. But actually it's actually not a form of calming behavior. It's just that at the moment the dog doesn't know how to respond. But it's very different where a dog willingly show his or her tummy letting you run. So even for cats, um, some pet owners, they like to scruff their cats. Basically, they use their hand and then they, they just pull up the neck, like similar to how the lioness um, pull up the lion cup. So a lot of times, this kind of scruffing behavior, even though the cat is not moving, unfortunately, it also um, doesn't mean that the cat is okay with the scenario, just that they cannot respond to the fearful stimulus. So actually, when they are actually stuck in the body posture and then the fearful stimulus, for example, uh, if you're going to shower your cat or you're going to cut your nails of the cat, actually, they are even more fearful because they cannot respond to it. So, talking about some um, other cat behavioral uh, cues. So, for example, terrified, super terrified, and then uh, you heard actually what it actually means is just looking at the tail. The subtle swishing twish of the tail. A lot of times when you look at a cat um, sitting somewhere and then the tail is just sweeping back and forth. It doesn't mean that the cat is necessarily calm. A lot of times, it's just that the cat is just a, the tail is like a window to the mind of the cat. So it's like the cat trying to decide is this situation cool? Is it chill? Or am I supposed to defend myself? Then, um, so the anxious cat where the ears are to the side, the pupils are dilated. And then, most importantly, you know, you need to be familiar with the posture of the relaxed cat, or the friendly cat, and the trusting cat that show your belly. So next we talk about rabbits. So like, um, so these graphics are from ISPCA uh, UK, talking about the rabbits where they are lying down, they're relaxed, their legs are stretched out, they are comfortable where they are. All these are um, good body language cues, shows that your rabbit is actually comfortable. But then a worried rabbit, usually the posture will be changed, the muscle will be tense, it will be a cross position, the pupils will be dilated, and then they will hide somewhere. The truth, try, try to move away from the negative stimulus. So the angry or a very unhappy rabbit, so uh, we know, always know, so some rabbits, they would like to storm. We're trying to show they're uncomfortable. And then uh, hopefully you'll never ever get to see this because it's an extremely uh, unhappy and uh, upset rabbit. And then the rabbit moving away. And a lot of times, uh, when, it, when it stand on the back leg, sometimes uh, some pet owners may, may misjudge it as a cute behavior. But a lot of times, actually, the rabbit is trying to Send up trying to absorb all the information with the ears, eyes, and nose from the environment for them to decide what to do next. So a slide here just to talk about pocket pets in general. Um, they are prey species, they don't do well with stress. So I have a um, story about a guinea pig owner who was trying to cut the guinea pig nails at home. So the guinea pig was quite stressed with the whole uh, interaction, was struggling quite a bit. So the owner was like, Good boy, good boy, almost done soon, just cutting the nails. And then uh, trying to comfort the guinea pig at the same time. The halfway through, the guinea pig stopped struggling. Uh, so the, the pet owner was like, okay, uh, good boy, almost done soon. The pet owner actually thought that uh, the guinea pig finally 
realize that it's actually not a big deal. There's, so after, after cutting the nails finished already, then the pet owner actually looked at the guinea pig and realized uh, the guinea pig unfortunately um, passed away. The guinea pig was so stressed, there was a heart attack and then died in his arms and wasn't even aware of it. So it's a very, very sad um, story, but hopefully it impacts you, it leaves a deep impact. Remember that actually stress is always potentially life-threatening. It's very, very dangerous in rabbits and guinea pigs and hamsters. So most importantly, it's always important to go slow, take frequent breaks. You don't need to cut all the nails today. You can cut a few, take a break, do it tomorrow, do it, give it in steps by step, step by step and give them ample space. Uh. So if you want to train them, also need to give space. You can use treats, you can use like blueberries or what your guinea pig or rabbit likes to eat. The training also, you need to space out, take longer for them to actually cope. So truthfully, what exactly is anxiety? So it's an emotional response, anticipating a future danger. So if I see the dog see or sees a stranger, they worry that the stranger may actually do something to them, they are wary. So sometimes the threat may be real or imagine the, the stranger may just walk past, not going to do anything at all. And then uh, maybe normal or abnormal. Abnormal meaning that the response doesn't quite fit the actual stimulus. For example, let's say a stranger is standing like uh, five meters away. It's, it's quite normal for a dog to be wary, keep looking at the stranger, don't want to break eye contact, these things like that. But potentially it could be abnormal for the dog to straight away lunge and attack the stranger. So if you look at this picture here, uh, this particular dog is showing some behavioral cues. It's turning away from the camera, facing the wall. But at the same time, you can actually, the image may not be so good, but actually the eye is trying to keep looking and see what actually the human being is doing. So behavioral signs of anxiety, hypervigilance, as we mentioned earlier, panting, scanning, trying to see, make sure they're not missing out anything, restlessness, pen, pacing, trembling, so uh, salivation, hiding, escape, all these are the common ones that I think we all know. So gastrointestinal upsets, like vomiting, diarrhea also can happen. Uh, a lot of times we get stress, diarrhea, unfortunately. And then, um, and then for rabbits and uh, guinea pigs, they also can get gut stasis because they are stressed. And gut stasis, as all the pocket pet owners would know, is always a uh, medical condition that could be potentially uh, be life-threatening. So then next, we talk about fear. So fear is a direct emotional response to a potentially harmful danger or stimulus. So when a, when a threat is perceived, the responses, it's important to take note because depending on how big the threat is, the response may escalate. Eventually, it may include elements of defensive aggression when the pet tries to defend uh, herself or himself. And then when you walk down the spectrum, as the emotions escalate, it can become phobia. So phobia is where the intense emotional response, where the response is actually out of proportion to the stimulus. So why is anxiety or fear a problem? So it's a problem usually when it's out of context and it's also occurring at a constant and elevated level. So mainly um, the stimulus is the same, but the response by the animal is actually increasing with each episode. So that's usually when uh, you need some form of behavioral intervention and it also interferes with normal functioning. For example, we mentioned our pocket pets where the fear and the stress affects the appetite, they stop eating and then uh, can lead to gut stasis. So what, what can I do to manage anxiety and fear in my fear baby? So the first thing first, the main thing is to, have to visit the vet if the pet hasn't been checked recently because the main thing is that uh, you want to rule out any uh, known sources of pain or discomfort because pain and discomfort can contribute to FAS, which is fear, anxiety, and stress. And then it's also important to determine the state of health of the animal and then address any underlying issues. Next, um, providing a safe and predictable environment is important to manage anxiety or fear. So in the situation, it's important to remove or reduce the stimulus. If you want to do behavior modification training, it's important Possibly, they may, you need to reschedule it where the fear or anxiety is on a lower level, where the pet is more susceptible to training. Most important thing is that fear actually impedes learning. When they're too fearful, they can't be bothered to learn new things. And then, over learning being calm by rewarding spontaneous calm behavior is helpful. So, in the next slide, so how, how does this work? So, when you catch a calm behavior, you have to reward passively by a word of quiet praise. So when a cat or a dog is just resting in the corner, so it's important that you do not engage 
your dog, your pet, so that you don't actually uh, make them even actually, you don't actually stimulate them, they break them out of that calm behavior pattern. So usually, uh, in this situation, just a word of praise, like, good boy, like from, from a five, it's good enough, for, and then you, usually a treat wouldn't work, because usually if you take out a treat, the dog hears the plastic sound, or the cat hears the plastic sound, the cat will wake up, break out that calm body posture and run towards you already. So uh, if you go watch on YouTube, I, there's a few uh, good examples of how this actually works. And then um, next is um, behavior modification program, the actual training regime. So later we'll talk about that later. The main thing is that uh, punishment seldom has a role because actually punishment increases anxiety and fear and then prevents learning of autonomous calm behaviors. So using a medication is uh, usually necessary in, con in situations where the fear and anxiety is so high that the, the pet is not sus like susceptible to whatever you're saying or doing. So they just so much fear in their mind, they are, the fear is clouding their brain. So usually the medication will be prescribed by a vet and um, so usually is to lower the state of arousal and usually for conditions that's like the fear is affecting the pet for like years really. So usually it's to make the training easier actually, it's not to replace the training. So our training is to reduce practice of fearful responses. So that, um, so what we mean is that at the beginning to reduce the exposure so that you prevent the fear from escalating each time. And then teaching alternative responses, so like relaxation, going to the crate, talk about crate training later. And then the main thing is this is not behavior training. So it's not talking about sit, stand, or stay, these things like that, because actually if there's fear, there's uh, adversive stimulus, you're telling your pet or dog to stay, it actually will escalate the fear because they cannot run away, they cannot move away. They cannot exhibit normal behavior. So we want relaxed body postures, as we mentioned earlier um, in the first few slides about the body language. And then most importantly, it goes slow at a pet's uh, pace, because like um, at the end of the day, they cannot, rationalize what's actually happening. They can't understand why you are doing this. Then uh, if you go too fast, what you risk is that you may lose them. They may become aversive to what we're trying to do. And then flooding is also not encouraged. So we talk about flooding in the next slide. But then the main thing is that um, flooding have a risk of escalating the fear and then they shut down, they freeze. So the next slide, um, image disclaimer, if you ask, Get of spiders, you may not close your eyes for a few seconds. So this is flooding. So flooding is bad. So for example, if an individual is fearful of spiders, if you throw them into a room full of spiders and you just keep putting more spiders, eventually, unfortunately, they will still be fearful of spiders. Or they may even, they may even be even more fearful. It escalate to more like a phobia kind of uh, emotional state. So we talk about um, Freezing, it's all about scruffing or restraining the animal. Let's say uh, you actually scruff your cat. Your cat is afraid of spiders and you just keep throwing on spiders at them. Yes, so you can imagine what's actually happening in their brain with all the fear emotions. Yeah, so um, so next we talk about conditioning. So classical conditioning is, uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with it, uh, about ringing a bell, giving a treat. Eventually, when you ring a bell, the dog starts to celebrate because they associate the bell with the treat. So this is um, what relevant with uh, conditioning neutral stimulus to the pet. So for example, later we talk about uh, body wraps to help calm the pet, these things like that. Um, classic, classical conditioning will be helpful. Another very common classical conditioning actually when you praise your pet. So you think about it, good girl or good boy, actually from the pet's point of view has no meaning. But over time, classical conditioning where you actually say these words in your response to your pet and you're giving, showering them with treats, you also associate good boy or good girl the praise to be a positive experience. Next is counter conditioning, which is also very important, where let's say there's a stranger comes, every time the stranger appear 10 meters away, it's raining out from the sky. So eventually, the, the, the dog will associate the stranger with trees raining down from the sky, and then they actually will be very, very willing to see this. So talking about how to deliver treats, a lot of times actually, the main thing here is that my point at the bottom, where practice offer until you give treats where both of you are smooth and relaxed when taking the food. So a lot of times you need to um, make sure that the, the pet actually calm and relax before you reward them. So this is to prevent them from getting too excited. 
going to uh, rouse before they actually uh, receive the treat. Also, when you give the treat, you give it using your own, own hands to make sure that they actually um, they don't mouth you. They only mouth the treat exactly so that you enforce bite inhibition. So when they do it correctly and then you give them the treat. And talk about being respectful of the flight zone. If you look at my pointer at the slides, so hopefully you can see the humans are here. The humans are the adversive stimulus and then all the sheep are just to the side. So this distance here is the flight zone. So a lot of times when you do training, the adversive stimulus, the negative stimulus must start at the edge of the flight zone. So if, you, if the particular negative stimulus is too close, the animal will shut down. The animal will not be willing to receive treat at all. So counter conditioning doesn't work if the pet is too fearful. Then next, talk about the reward ladder because actually not all rewards are equal. Not all treats are equal. So a pet may uh, prefer um, canned treats, jerky treats, or dry treats. So each pet will have its own preferences. You as a pet owner uh, most likely will know best. And then if you look at this uh, image here, trying to parallel this in the human world. So if you're working $5 per hour compared to working $100 per hour, of course, $100 is like the best possible thing. So a lot of times, real meat, like a chicken, beef, all these things is, is always very helpful. But the hard reward is, is usually packed with uh, situations where the and adversity stimulus is perceived to be the highest. So let's say, if let's say the, the fear, the stranger is, too near, sometimes like a dry treat with the dog doesn't really like, or, you, or even worse, you give the normal regular keeper, the dog may not respond to the keeper at all. But if you take a chicken breast that's cooked, the dog may suddenly be, eh, they, they, they suddenly momentarily be distracted, they forget about stranger, rather they pay attention to the, the chicken breast instead. So talking about alternative forms of reward, a lot of times actually, for, especially for cats. Some cats actually, they are more, uh, attracted to play, string toys, these things like that, rather than food. So we need to do a bit of trial and error what your pet perceives as the high level reward. So next we talk about example. So storm and uh, noise phobia. We usually list this example because uh, we have seen a few cases over the years of um, cats and dogs very rarely uh, pocket pets falling off high buildings when they're trying to avoid the negative stimulus, which is unfortunately thunderstorms in Singapore. At SPCA, we see around uh, five cats a week who fell off from tall buildings. We seldom see dogs because unfortunately, a lot of them actually uh, die upon impact. So actually, it's quite a dangerous uh, phenomenon. So a lot of times, if we can actually tackle this, we can actually help them cope with thunderstorms, actually that will tremendously improve their animal welfare. So why would animals be afraid of thunderstorms or noise in general? So first thing first, their sense of hearing is a lot better than us. A lot of times uh, there are other contributions like changes in air pressure, ultrasonic sounds that we are unable to perceive. So a lot of times the pet can actually, are actually afraid of all these other things that we are unaware of. So if the fear is actually mild, Playing with the pet or providing for distraction might be helpful. But then the main thing is that in that um, negative scenario where the pet is fearful, punishing or ignoring your dog uh, or your pet or cat, it's not going to be uh, beneficial because by ignoring them or punishing them, you're actually escalating their anxiety and their fear. So you need to do, to help them is to desensitize them and then counter condition. So depending on the level of fear, let's say if the during the thunderstorm your dog's going berserk, or cat is also going berserk, it's like running around trying to find a place to hide. Um, then medication will be required at least at the beginning to try to dampen down the fear, so that the pet is more willing to to learn new behaviors. So this uh, infographic right now talking about counter conditioning about, let's say in this scenario, the fear of fireworks is also another uh, loud noise that a lot of dogs are afraid of. So in the first instance, what they do is they use a speaker to play the noise. So because you think about it, if the adverse stimulus of a thunder is too loud, right from the beginning, each time right, it's a thunder storm that's too loud, the dog may not be, be receptive at all to any form of training. So you need to dial it small. Also our training, you need to make it easy for your pet. Start from baby steps. 
it, it's impossible for us humans to so like when you're primary one you go and take a level math so so you have to dial it down for dump it down for them so at the beginning the sound is soft and then you give them a treat and over time you can uh escalate the level of that sound so the common mistake is that uh, some people actually give the treat before the anticipated negative stimulus but over time what happens is that uh, they may actually associate the treat with the thunder, with the firewood, and then they are wary of the treat already. So all these images actually are um, from this website. It's very good to check it out. So next, um, so teaching your pet to be in a relaxed position. So being relaxed in the presence of the owner actually is very important. And then what I try to do is at the beginning, start slow and then gradually increase the time, making alone time fun, comfortable, and cozy. So talking about quick training. So the quick training, for example, is to be a comfortable place for them to spend time alone. So specifically for dogs, training your dog to see the crate as a safe haven. And for pocket pets and cats, they need to have hiding spots at home. So for cats specifically, uh, they bond not just with the pet owner, they bond with the environment as a whole. So that's why a lot of cats actually, they don't like leaving the home environment, go out for walks. And then for the home to be safe, if you check out uh, this website here by Ohio State U University called the Indoor Pet Initiative, talk about how do you improve the home environment, improve the hiding spots. Um, so that uh, the cat can actually uh, better cope with any negative stimulus. And once again, pocket pets don't respond well to stress. So a lot of times, it's important to give them places for them to hide, for them to escape. And the use of calming pheromones is um, useful for dogs and cats. For dogs, there's adaptive. For cats, there's fairly way. And for pocket pets, a lot of times, you need to use familiar odor. So what you do is you put a towel at the bottom for them to use to run around, walk on top of it, and they use this same brick in the put in the carrier when you bring the pet for transport. So the familiar odors is always with them. And then uh, for this commercial pheromones, this calming pheromones, for dogs there's a collar version, and then there's a diffuser version where you plug to the wall point, and then the spray. But most importantly, the spray the use on um, fabrics, not on the cat or the dog, and then the spray itself takes thirty minutes to kick in, and then the body wrap. Uh, is the for example this one is a thunder shirt thunder shirt for cats oh, they also have thunder shirts for for dogs as well cats and dogs then the main thing is that they don't necessarily work rough right from the box you actually have to do some prior classical conditioning to help the pair the, the the cats or the dog um, cope how do i put it to associate the thunder shirt with uh, positive behaviors and then for pocket pets there's also the towel wrapping where you wrap them with a towel. You also need classical conditioning. You reward them while they are being wrapped. And subsequently, when you need to do some husbandry procedures like cutting their nails or cleaning their ears, you can actually wrap them to feel safe. So most importantly, you do not punish or scold them when they are upset because that actually only makes things worse. And it's pointless to ignore them. When you ignore them, what happens is actually will make them more anxious. They are confused. They are, you as the pet owner, you are the leader in the relationship. So what they're actually trying to do is they look to you for guidance for what to do next. But actually, if you ignore them, they make things worse. They're very confused and they actually escalate the fear. So a lot of times, actually, the pet owner themselves actually have to remain quiet and calm because they actually feed off your energy. So if you become too stressed, if you become too worked up, become too aroused, become upset, they actually, the energy you also channel to them, they become more and more upset. So I don't have a lot of time left. So talking about um, further ancillary aid you can do to help the situation. So the first thing first, slow, you have to remove the trigger. At the moment in time, if you do behavior modification, then and then when the postman is there and the dog is barking berserkly, it's not the time to do the behavior training. So the training will be after the adversive episode, then and then you can slowly train. Unfortunately, training is going to take, um, unfortunately, weeks or even months. And then coming music is something that is helpful. There's a particular brand called True A Dog's Ears that works for dogs. And then the music helps to drown out the sound. And then also, like I mentioned, calms the owners down, which also will be helpful to don't arouse the pet in that, in that situation. So animal massage is something you can try. And then giving food puzzles to help the pet as a bit normal behavior is also very important. So a lot of times you need to take the consideration 
your own pet's preference, what they actually perceive as a reward. If your dog like blueberry more than meat related treats, then use blueberries, for example. And then sleep is very important as well. So let's say um, the, reno the, the neighbors are renovating the house next door, there's constant drilling, the pet cannot sleep well. What happens is that then they will, will lower their tolerance, they're more likely to be anxious and fearful. And also need to emphasize bringing your pet to the vet. So let's say some pets actually have arthritis, they cannot lie down properly, they cannot sleep well, they also so prevent them from resting and more likely to have, well, well actually how this works is so, when they don't have proper rest, they have a shorter bandwidth, they're more likely to be stressful. And then talking about pharmaceuticals or nutraceuticals, which is actually supplements. So you need to consult your vet to know which one to start them on. So there are a lot of types on the market to choose from actually. So supplements in general, they are safe. And the disadvantage for that is that um, they take a long time, if, usually a two to three months to see any improvement. And usually there's a plateau. So let's say the fear is extreme or is elevated. Unfortunately, supplements may not be sufficient. So that's when we take out the medications. So medications are stronger. Uh, the main thing is that uh, there are two types. There's one for temporary scenarios and one for long-term um, situations. Long-term situations are more for pets who are more on the anxious side. They're usually fearful. So, so the long-term medications is maybe what your vet recommends. But the main thing is that in all situations, you need to couple them with um, training. So the medications itself is not a, the only solution. So after training, when the pet copes better, builds more confidence, then you can slowly wean off the medication. So most importantly, if all else fails, you need to seek help. There's also um, there's a limit to how much you can like watch YouTube, Google, read forums. If you keep if if there's no improvement, you keep banging to the wall. Sometimes it's still not working. Best is to actually seek real life in person help, either from a veterinarian or from a trainer. So the longer these conditions are uh, untreated, unrecognized, what happens is that they escalate and it becomes more and more difficult and more and more complex. The, the fear becomes so deeply embedded in the pet's mind. So it's a good idea to start early and also visit the vet as well, really, because sometimes a lot of, a lot of situations actually, there's an underlying medical condition and so usually it's an easy fix. And then once you start medication, you diagnose the condition, then the pet actually emotionally and psychologically improves. So I guess the, be at the end was a bit rushed, but we have come to the end today for the talk. Thank you, Dr. Chow, for the insightful talk. Um, we have received quite a number of questions in our chat box and we'll be addressing them shortly. Um, Dr. Chow, actually, I have a question for you. In your last slide, you mentioned that there might be underlying medical reasons mm. why a pet might present as anxious or aggressive. Uh, in your experience, could you share what is the common medical reasons you have seen for dogs and cats? Yeah, so so the talk about the easy ones for cats actually. So when a common um, things that some pet owners observe is when a cat gets older, like an elderly senior cat, then the cat actually uh, is a bit more grumpy, a bit more aversive to strangers. When they try to cut the nails, the cat struggle more, these things like that. Then actually, um, for senior cats, they are higher risk of uh, hyperthyroidism, which is the thyroid actually is a hormone that regulates the bodily function. So, and then for these cats, once you diagnose the condition, you start on the hyperthyroid medication, actually their emotional well-being actually improves, they become more chill, they actually goes back to their previous behavior. So a lot of times don't associate your grumpiness with just being old, really. Mm. How about dogs? Uh, so for dogs, uh, there's another interesting case that we, we have seen a while ago is where there's an old dog where becomes a lot more uncooperative. So when you're trying to clean their ears or trying to pet their head, the dog is like just flinging, it's like very uh, defensive. Then what I actually re realized is that actually the dog, uh, because of old age, the teeth is actually all rotten. It's very painful around the mouth. So anyone out there who has a rotten uh, tooth will understand it's actually quite painful even at one. So imagine this particular dog. I mean, for pets, we don't brush our teeth commonly. So a lot of times when they're older, they have multiple rotten teeth. So this chronic pain actually make them so upset all the time. So when you move the hand near the face, they actually thought that the hand is the one causing the pain. But truthfully, it's the teeth that's causing the pain. So for this particular patient, after we did dental, we extracted the rotten teeth. Actually, the dog become very nice, really. The dog is like coming up to you for pets and this, this thing like that. 
letting you stroke the chin. So a lot of times, you can imagine for this pet, this dog now is a lot more relief because of that. Mm. that. That's great to hear and really, really interesting to know. I wonder if it's applied to uh, children as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let's get a look at the questions. Uh, we have received quite a number of questions. Mm. Um, Oh yes, so yeah. um, let's, let's just, see. Uh, get the question onto the. Let's look at the questions now. Where is it? Where is it? Yeah. Um. Okay, let, let me just uh, read out the question first. So, um, my dog has a fear of car rides. Oh, this ah, question yeah. is from Joanne. Thank you, Joanne, for your question. My dog has a fear of car rides. She associates car rides with doctor's appointments. She will whine throughout the journey. What do I need to do? Yeah, so this is actually a very good question because it's commonly faced by a lot of pet owners out there. And it affects not just um, dogs, the cats, and other pocket. Well, so the main thing is that um, you need to associate there's a few steps to it. So one thing is you need to eventually associate um, the vet clinic appointments to be more pleasant experiences and also associate the car rides to more pleasant experiences. So you talk about the car rides first. So the, there's a few things we can, as we mentioned earlier. So um, the coming pheromone, um, adaptive or fairly way is something definitely you can try. And the main thing is that the pheromone takes at least 30 minutes to kick in. So if you spray on a fabric, you need to wait a while. And then the next thing is that um, for pocket pads, you need to use uh, fabric with their familiar odors. Sometimes actually even odors of the pet owner will work as well. So if and then the next thing is actually whether your pet is actually susceptible to treats in the car. So if the pet is actually not willing, then actually then you need to break it down to smaller steps. Uh. So at the beginning it can be something as subtle as the car's engine is not switched on and then you're just giving treats to the dog while the dog is just inside the car. And then after that, that's the end of training session. You just you just let the dog leave the car and then you go back home. So you actually have to break the whole something as simple as a car into small little steps. And then so, so break the baby steps and then for the dog to and the cat even to slowly cope with each scenario. So whenever let's say you when you start the engine, when the car starts moving, when the dog is not willing to eat treats, that's when you realize okay, you need to dial back a bit. And then a lot of times, actually, uh, from my experience, um, pure behavior training alone without any uh, medication or supplements sometimes will take a very, very long time. Eventually, it will work, but sometimes may not, pet owners may not have that uh, patience. So some form of uh, temporary medication that works for one to two hours to dampen the fear uh, can uh, make training a lot easier. So it's something you can uh, discuss with your vet. Mm. So okay, let's, let's move on to the next question. Mm. So this one says, Hi, Dr. Chow. I've got a Singapore special puppy who is now one year old, who was always okay with people or strangers coming into the house. But recently, when younger guests come into the house, my dog tries to bite, chase, and bark at them. Why and what do we do in this situation? So there's uh, two parts to this question. Huh? So is your dog wary of younger guests or is it because your dog uh, is now older. So when a uh, dog is younger, puppy age, when they're all happy and these things like that, they're usually very open to new stimulus. And then when they grow older, they become more wary. Adolescence age, which is like 8 to 12 months, usually when you start to see that the dog is more fearful. Then, uh, so usually what happens is that then right now, uh, so regardless whether it's, is it younger guests in particular or is it just because the dog is now older, so in this situation right now, you talk about the counter conditioning will be helpful. So you get uh, friends or family on board where actually you pass them treats uh, before they come to the house. So maybe you need to like leave the house, go downstairs, meet them downstairs, pass them the treats, you come back home and then your guests come to the door and then depending on how your dog reacts. So sometimes what you actually need to do is the, the guests don't even step in. The guests, the guests just feed treats through the metal gate, for example. So once again, you need to break down the baby steps. Uh. And then, uh, so after that, truthfully, you need, to, uh, you need to find a relative or a friend that is willing to help. Because this will be an uh, activity that's going to take weeks. 
So this particular friend will be committed. So then it's, like, it's not like a one-off thing. So every time if you use a different guess, right, you also make it harder for your dog to cope in this scenario. So that's why uh, you need to find someone and then maybe treat them, treat them to the mail afterwards for them to help you with this situation. So let's say if the scenario where giving treats at the gate, right, the dog actually not receptive. The dog just constantly barking through the metal gate when your dog, when your friend is trying to give the treat. So what happens next is actually then you need to dive back. So your friend actually is standing a few meters away from the metal gate. And then you at Pelner is the one that's winning treats. So the distance where the your pet, the dog is willing to eat, that's when the distance is the flight zone. That's where you need to start. And then after a few times, you do for like 15 minutes, probably you need to take a break. And then you try again, your, your friend take one step closer. The next thing is a lot of times you need to kind of emphasize how much that you don't squeeze everything in one training session. You need to split it into multiple parts, really. And then maybe you do two times a week, these things like that. And then you slowly, hopefully, if it's start now by Christmas, <laughs> I'm not joking, not Christmas, but yes, as you can imagine, it'll take a, it'll take a while. Mm. Maybe by next new year, yeah. <laughs> all your yeah. guests will be fine. <laughs> Okay, thank, thanks very much mm. for sharing. Um, let's move on to the next question. We really have them coming in fast yeah. now. Um, let's take a look at this question from yeah. Fan Catherine. So, mm. hi, Dr. Chow. My dog has a fear of grooming, for example, when I'm doing nail trimming and yeah. ear cleaning. I believe it's due to bad experience when she was younger. So, how do we tackle this? So, this is a very, very good question because, like, um, personally for my dog, um, I also started training when she was young. And then what happens now is I am able to cut her nails without any form of restraint. So at the beginning, what I did was uh, someone was holding on to her, we cut one nail, and then we give a treat. And then you do it a few times. Then right now, you can slowly dial down the treats. Right now, after I cut, finish all four paws, then she gets a treat. So a lot of times, this is, uh, this is the ultimate state that I think is ideal. Because a lot of times, if you use your own strength to like wrestle with your dog and then you cut the nails. Even you get the job done, cutting nails is like a common husbandry thing. You can't be okay fighting a dog for the rest of the dog's life. So right now for, for this particular situation, you may need to down, down, you start from the beginning. Talking about nail trimming for specifically, you may need to get the dog used to getting restrained first, giving to the treat, restrained, holding the leg, give it a treat. Once the dog is comfortable with that, cut one nail and you give the treat. And if the dog is very fearful of the nail clipper, you may need to change. There's something called the nail fowler, electric nail fowler, where it's just, it's a, um, a lot of dogs actually find that less frightening. So when they actually foul down the nails, so actually you have to break the activity to small little steps, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Let's talk about ear cleaning. Let's say if you take out the ear cleanser, your dog runs away, then you know that's when you start. Where just taking the cleanser and giving the treat. So the dog actually associates. So as you imagine, it's quite tedious. But it is important because right now, uh, we are stage in Singapore where a long time ago, where dogs live to seven years old is a big deal. But nowadays, your dogs live easily to 15 years old. So let's say if your dog is even 10 years old right now, right, there's five more years. So if you think about it, if you can start, the best time to start is 10 years ago, to be honest. But right now, it's just, oh, the next best time. Yeah. Mm where you make all these things a pleasant experience for them. Yeah. Okay, that, that's a really good analogy. We, we always wish we did something yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions on alternative therapies. So things like essential oils, yep. flower remedy. So maybe uh, there's a couple of questions. So uh, we have one from Hemi Yo. Yep. Hi, do you think it's uh, essential oil is helpful to calm and soothe dog's anxiety? And just before we go to that, there's another yep. question from uh, Kenny Deer. Hi, do you think Flower Remedies is working for cats who have anxiety. And my cat has scanning behavior. Is it a sign of anxiety? So perhaps we can tackle these two yeah. questions. Which are so similar. essential oil itself is an interesting one because there are no clinical scientific research studies that show that they work. But the main thing is that if the essential oil calms you down, that will also benefit your pet, really. And then, uh, so I think there's no harm, no harm trying. But then the essential oil at this at the end of the day, it's not gonna be the sole solution. If as you have imagined by now, there's no one magic bullet. A lot of times a lot of things working in conjunction to help the situation. 
So floral remedy is also an interesting one because right now there's a study trying to figure out if chamomile is helpful for cats, but it's very, very early in the, res in the research phase. So we will find out soon enough. And then um, for scanning behavior, I would say you really need to try and see if you can identify any specific trigger. So I, will, I have noticed that my cats sometimes they scan, or uh, actually because there are birds flying around outside the house. So actually because they are engaged, they are trying, but it may not be a fearful thing. So it's not that straightforward. So maybe you need to uh, do a bit of investigation to find out. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's look at this one. Interesting. Uh, we have the question from Genevieve. Hi, Dr. Chow. I have a senior Jack Russell who is very aggressive when meeting other dogs on leash during days around the neighborhood. However, at dog parks off leash, she does not confront or approach other dogs and instead chooses to follow us around. So why is it so different? Yeah, so this is a very good question because it has used to be a viral uh, video on YouTube a while ago where there is a car gate between two dogs barking crazily at each other. Then once the car gate moves, and then they suddenly realize it, then they stop. They realize that they can fight and they can interact, they just stop fighting. Right? Then once the car gate closes again, then they start barking like crazy again. So it's a very, very similar scenario where um, when a particular Jerasa is on a leash and held by the owner, they have this level of confidence. Uh. Then, so another interesting thing is, I would suspect if the leash is held by a different person, your pet will respond differently as well. So a lot of times in certain dog training classes, um, where there is uh, some form of dog-to-dog uh, -dog aggression, these things like that, certain trainers will encourage like swapping dogs, pass the dog around, each safe distances apart, of course, and then um, each, each dog pass to a different, different pet owner, and then you observe the pet's behavior. So, so at this moment right now, I guess the main thing is you know that your pet is uh, aggressive on leash, so I guess you need to be careful, and then potentially need to do some form of uh, behavior modification so that they dampen down that uh, aggressiveness. But then, but so it's a silver lining that your pet actually recognizes that in a dog run, the, higher, the social dynamics is different. So they don't actually go and chase after and lunch after another dog. Yeah, so I guess that's, that's why it's different. Now. But in terms of uh, training, I recommend you do some training when on a leash. Now. Because uh, I'm not sure how senior the dog is. Mm. Yeah. Great. I hope I hope that helped, um, Genevieve. Now we have another question by Ashley. So I, I think this question is really interesting because I think a lot of owners might face this yeah. at home with their, their pets jumping uh, up, uh. Um, whether jumping up on the sofa a bit or yeah. jumping up on humans or guests. So uh, Ashley asks, Hi, Dr. Chow. How should I work with the following issue with my dog? How should I get my dog off the sofa or bed? She likes to jump up when she's excited and we have difficulties getting her down because she might show a bit of teeth and try to nip us when we carry her down. So I suspect this one is actually a symptom of uh, resource guarding. So basically when the dog is on the sofa, uh, the dog perceives the particular position at home as a, a pleasant experience. So when you're trying to remove her from the environment, she gets upset really. And so, so now we understand that's the dog's perspective, then you understand the human's perspective. So that of course that like, you don't want to dirty the sofa, you don't want to dirty the bit. Also because it's so you also need to move the dog somewhere else. So uh, what I would think about is that using Leos, Leo training, using treats or other things that the dog perceives as um, attractive instead of physically moving, removing her from that position. Or another thing you can do is when a dog eventually jumps off the bed of the sofa, you give the treats and reward. So they realize actually jumping. So what you need to do is now you need to make jumping on the bed more rewarding than being on the sofa and the bed. Mm. Yeah, so that's the thing you need, that's the thing you need to think about. And then uh, the next thing is actually I have met a sim, but the family realizes that the dog only shows teeth when a specific family members try to remove her from the position. So there's also something to indicate. Does it apply to all family members? Yeah. Mm. So sometimes if a specific family member, then the specific family member may also contribute to the trigger. Yeah. Yeah. I mm. think it's very important to be aware of the environment for the dog. So not just the owner, 
owner or the main handler, but everyone yeah. else who might interact with the dog because everyone plays a part in yeah. the dog's life. Yeah. Mm. Um, I wonder if giving the dog a bit, his own bit, his own yes, little for sure, territory for sure. would help. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so the concept of crate training, where giving the uh, dog his own comfortable and pleasurable space is also very important. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we have... Uh, we're running out of time, but I think we have quite a few uh, questions that we would really still like to address. So maybe I would take uh, Nadia's question. So Nadia was one of our first few uh, viewers who asked the question. So, so definitely we would like to take your question. So Nadia asks, my client's dog was possibly abused back in Hong Kong when, my, when his owners had to move to Singapore first. He showed aggression towards visitors, especially when the owners are in the house when he moved to Singapore. I couldn't even put a harness on him. He would constantly bark and tried to lunge at me several times. He bit my arm once during one of our meet and greet sessions, so he was sent for a two-week training session at his trainer's house. Things have been proved, and I can take him out uh, for walks by himself. Um, but let's see what's the rest of the question. What's well, quite <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but he's still aggressive at the moment when the owners enter the house. So may I know why this is so? Client dog. <laughs> okay, so this is not their dog, it's someone else's dog. So I guess this one for sure is, is really sounds like quite a complex issue that has been happening for a long period of time. So really, practically speaking, it's difficult for me to give something concrete in the next three minutes uh, really and then uh, if i can solve this in the next three minutes i will be like uh insulting all the dog trainers and vets out there really but the main thing is really you portion the sick in person help and a lot of times uh you also need to consider when you, whether you get um medications and supplements on board so most likely you need supplements for sure i think will be beneficial medications also and then concurrent with the training then over time slowly uh, can slowly shape the dog's behavior and be less likely to perceive all these things as threats uh, in their home environment yeah um but for sure i think you, you need to solve this because every time there's a bite right, we are worried that the bite will escalate so a lot of times uh the first few bites sometimes there's only just a minor skin tear but then we are worried that the the, the dog will bite harder and harder so potentially maybe, uh, human health and safety involved as well yeah, so it's, I, would, I would think it's quite urgent to be solved. Yeah. Mm, mm. Yeah, mm. I think with this, we, like, like you mentioned, it does escalate. So it yeah. might start as a little nip first, um, but it can very quickly escalate to, to more bites and more yeah. severe bites. And um, there's actually an N Dunbar bite scale, which yes. uh, ranks, you can Google it, or, or we could share a link here uh, later in the comments, but uh, it's a bite range from one to six, and where six. Bite, well, one, one is like a near, near bite, so it doesn't actually make contact. Mm. But six is actually um, death of a human, which nobody ever wants. So, so it's really important to, to address biting issues early. For sure, you cannot ignore. Um, yep. like, otherwise, you'll get worse already. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we will take a last question, perhaps. Um, we have a question from Amanda Yi. Hi, Dr. Chow. My puppy is four months old. I kept her in the house pending her final vaccination until recently. Now I'm trying to acclimatize her to walks, but she shows signs of stress on walks. How shall I break this into steps? So a lot of times, uh, breaking uh, if you have the luxury of having different points of exits and entrances that will help going by a different door, because let's say it's always the same route, the, the dog most likely will respond the same. It's hard for you to... I would imagine right now if you give a, try to give a treat when the puppy is outdoors, the puppy is not willing to take the treat at all. So then, um, so giving a different route, like let's say if you always turn, go down the leaf and turn left, not turn right instead, that's where it gives you a chance of uh, starting anew. The next thing is also try walking at home. Positively condition the harness or the leash first, breaking down the small steps where the puppy associates the leash with pleasurable experiences then the next actually just leaving the door don't go too far and then you have to really work slowly and then you have to think about the level of fear also and then because right now you have time on your side because at a four month old puppy they are very uh teachable very trainable and then if you do it now uh, there's a high success rate already and then if you have not yet engaged a trainer highly recommend you engage a trainer and also uh 
uh, if the puppy is fearful, you have to really dial it down for them. A lot of times, uh, some pup, if how do I put it? If you keep dragging them walking, and then the fear just keep piling up as you go along. Yeah. Mm. So, so then this is how you can try. Uh, but it, you for sure you get a trainer, and for sure this is very very trainable. Uh, yeah. So this is good news actually that you detect this. Yes, that, that's, that's a great observation and, and we encourage mm. you to have, have the patience, I think, really, that's key mm. and have the knowledge um, to, to do so. Yeah, yeah. try home first, really. Mm. Okay, great. So, th thank you so much. We've actually come to the end of the session, so we, we unfortunately aren't able to take all the questions, but thank you so much for tuning in and we hope you've learned something interesting. Uh, we especially want to thank Dr. Chow for sharing thank all you. his anecdotes and, and stories uh, with us. So um, this video will be uploaded up on our AVS website later. So www.avs.gov.sg. Um, we thank you again for spending your Saturday morning with us and um, tune in next time for our next part on our animal series uh, webinars. Bye-bye. Goodbye.